Yeah, thank you, Wilhelm, for the introduction. And good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And thank you for sharing one hour of your personal time with us today on this Technical Tuesday session. Today, we're talking about microbial identification. Uh, before I start, just a bit of disclaimer. I work for Charles River Laboratories. And as you may know, Charles River offers microbial ID services under the Acugenics brand. And we do have an Acugenics lab based right in Singapore. Uh, but please don't worry. Um, I've done everything possible to debrand this presentation. So you're not going to hear a sales talk, but I might be a bit biased towards how Acugenics does stuff because I do believe that we are the best. But um, well, what I'm going to share today is really our experience and uh, hopefully useful information for you in terms of microbial ID and also some of our understanding of the uh, changes in the new Annex 1. So my presentation has two main parts. The first part is really on Annex 1 and uh, specifically some of the areas that are relevant to microbial ID, such as CCS, prevention mechanisms like trending, investigations, cleaning and disinfect disinfection, and monitoring. And the second part will be focusing on ID methodologies. We'll be looking at phenotypic, uh, prototypic, and genotypic methods. And also I have a small section, just one slide, well, two slides on outsourcing options. Okay, so uh, before I start, I do have a small poll question for you. I have a few of these scattered throughout the presentation and I really appreciate it. If you could participate in this, I see that the poll question has popped up already. Thank you. And let's give everybody some time to respond. So we currently have a total of 42 participants and response rates is coming up, so around 30%. So we encourage participation. And yeah, so just now at the start, I did not mention. So if you do have any questions, you know, in the middle of the presentation, please feel free to enter them into the chat box or you can keep it, you know, until the end and you can unmute yourself and then raise a question to Gary directly. Yeah, so okay, about if you see any question from the chat, you can interrupt me and I can try to address those throughout the presentation too. Yes, definitely. So we currently have um, 20 responses. So just to give another okay. 30 seconds. Okay, it seems okay. like All right, we Gary. have quite a, yeah, I can see it on the screen now. It seems like we have quite a good spread. Thank you for the responses. Uh, so the top two that we have is basically in-house phenotypic and in-house sequencer, but we also have about half of the correspondents that said they're outsourcing and 20% of that goes to phenotypic methods. Thank you very much and I, uh, hopefully this discussion will be useful for you because we are going to talk about all of these three methods and both in-house and outsourcing. All right. Now let's get into our agenda formally. We'll start with contamination control strategy. This is the definition from the new Annex 1 for CCS. I think by now anybody that's interested in this topic will have been uh, quite familiar with this. What I want to highlight here is that it in, it really high, um, it really focuses on decisions or strategies designed from current product and process understanding and how exactly do we gain this kind of understanding? How do we exactly understand our process and our environment and our product? The Annex 1 actually goes on to say, uh, to list out a few elements that goes into the CCS and how we can control their manufacturing process. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I've highlighted a few out there, uh, out here that's relevant to microbial ID. For example, cleaning and disinfection, monitoring systems, prevention mechanisms, including trending 
investigation, root cause analysis, and CAFA. And all of these is supposedly going to feed into a continuously a continuous improvement program that's supposed to elevate product quality over time. So we're going to look at all these elements in a bit more detail just shortly. This slide is, was presented by our colleagues from GSK at the PDA conference in Singapore back in 2020. So it actually demonstrates the wide range of aspects that falls under the CCAS umbrella. And we're not going to go through all of this in detail, but you can see that some of the elements that they highlighted include trending and monitoring uh, appeared several times. They also included risk assessment, personnel monitoring, investigations, cleaning and dis disinfection as well. So I've put it here as an, sort of an industry expert view on this CCS topic, and we will actually come back to this slide after we looked at some of the individual elements in this presentation. So we all know that prevention is better than remediation. So we'll start from uh, by one of the uh, prevention mechanisms trending as mentioned in the Annex 1. So when talking about trending, uh, Annex 1 talks about some common elements such as excursions, of course, you got to trend those, but also uh, microbial counts as well when it comes to microorganisms counts as well as the change in type of your microbial flora should be trended which would be looking at the types of microorganisms and the predominance of specific organism for example spore forming organisms and molds and also uh, Seasonality is one, one factor that might comes into play when we look at trending different types of organisms. And here we have an example from the data that we have at Actigenics. So because we have thousands of samples coming into our global network of nine, 10 lab laboratories. So we have a pretty good overview of the industrial average when it comes to the type of organism that's isolated. So what you see on this slide is the global top five fungal species that we see in our labs over a one year period of time. And why do we care about fungal? Because they can be problematic. Many of them can grow under very low nutrient environments. Many of them are spore formers, and we know that spores tend to spread more easily and also tend to be more resistant to antimicrobials and even sterilization cycles compared to normal cells. One last reason is that fungals tend to be metabolically diverse. So not only can they be a threat to patients, they can also affect the theoretical, the therapeutic properties of a drug product. So we do need to care about this. And in this trend, trend analysis, you can see a, quite a clear trend of the amount of well, the percentage of fungal isolates going up from the spring period uh, towards the fall autumn period of the year. Well, this might not be the case in Singapore because we only basically have one season, but in other places where there are seasonality changes, you do see this kind of variation in um, different frequencies of isolating different organisms over time. And being aware of these seasonal trend trends means that we can be proactive and address these uh, increase in fungal counts before they actually become too big of a problem. And with that, we've actually come to the next poll question. So how do we trend microbial data currently? Uh, we've all used Excel, or do you have uh, LIM systems in-house that's used for trending? or do you not trend? And if you selected others, please uh, feel free to type in the chat so we can all learn from each other. All right, just give everyone about a minute to participate in this poll. We currently have close to 40% response. Thank you very much. And we do see a couple of responses on other. So um, for those who have indicated other, please feel free, you know, to share with us in the chat box, you know, what system do you use you know, to do your trending?
another 20 seconds. So 65%, 68% responses. Thank you. All right, Gary, back to you. Yeah, oh, okay, here it is. Well, thank you. Uh, do we have any response in the chat box? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> so okay. perhaps, you know, they are a little bit too shy, but, you know, let's, let's give them some time and you can add on their inputs later on. Yes, sure. Uh, so thank you for your responses. Um, it's definitely good to see that we have the majority choosing that we are trending microbial data currently. And, and for those that have responded, we don't. And hopefully after this presentation, you would think again about whether you need to trend microbial data or not. All right, the next topic, still under the prevention program uh, mechanisms, is about investigation, recalls, analysis, and COPAS. And on this topic, I would like to quote another guidance document. This is from the PDA Technical Report 88, also quite a new uh, guidance report that talks about microbial data deviation investigations in the pharma industry. So when in, in this guidance report, you can see again that identifying the organisms is a critical step in laboratory investigations and knowledge of the source of the microbe can actually lead to determining how the microbe contaminated the product. But also based on the species, based on the type of the microorganisms that's implicated in your contamination event, you can assess what's the risk to the patient and also the product. Is the organism likely to survive and grow in your product? because we know that many organisms can be resistant to preservatives or antimicrobials, such as local diarrhea or patient complex. Or are they likely to survive terminal sterilization? We do, there, there are a number of species that are resistant to irradiation or ethylene oxide sterilization as well. If those bugs pops up, it's definitely a sign for alert. So an accurate ID is required to assess all these risks. And then again, it also talks about historical data and how it can be helpful to investigations. For example, have we seen a specific contaminant before? Have we seen a microbe before? Where, from which source, and so on. So all this highlights how the importance of accurate ID is not just applicable to critical areas, to your critical samples like your final product, but also from surrounding areas too, so that when you are conducting investigations and when you are reviewing historical trends, you have all this data to back you up. And just a little bit further in Annex 1, it talks about APS media fail, and it's quite clearly outlined over here that for media fail failures, anything isolated should be identified to species level to assist in the investigation into the likely source of contamination. And actually sometimes even species level ID is not good enough. It might even need to go down one level deeper to the strain level as we're gonna see in an example after this. Here we have an example of everybody's favorite subject, FDA warning letters. So it's a lot of words on this slide, but I just, briefly described to you that essentially this manufacturer had a failure in the media field that had growth and they identified 10 different microbes from the failed units, including spore formers and vegetative cells and all these different types as you can see on the slide. And what they concluded from the investigation is that this failure came from a contaminated valve that had so much bio burden that it survived the sterilization cycle made it into the media field samples and contaminated all that and become positive. And essentially what happened is that the FDA didn't buy it. They weren't conv convinced in the investigation and they challenged the conclusion that how do we identify not just spore forming microbes, but also vegetative microbes that supposedly survived your sterilization cycle. 
So in this case, what might have helped this manufacturer in their investigation, in addition to an accurate species level identification, is a strain typing uh, is a strain typing uh, activity. So, for example, if isolated uh, microbes from this critical media field failure samples, ten different species of it, and by sampling the manufacturing environment or equipment or personnel or reviewing historical data, they have recovered the same 10 different species from say 50 or 60 different places. So how do they know exactly where these 10 different species came from? Is it from the personnel, is it from the equipment? They can use something called strain typing. So strain typing essentially uses MLST, multi-locus sequence typing or SLST, single locus sequence typing that essentially looks at protein coding regions in the genome. That's in addition to your standard 16S or ITS2 regions that's used in sequencing, which gives you, um, to put it simple, it sequences more regions in the genome so that you have a better resolution into the strain level within the same species so that you know that from the product, you isolated this strain, and it's likely to come from this particular point from your EM or this particular point in your personnel monitoring and not the other. So in this case, you have a scientifically sound data-backed conclusion for your investigation to find your root cause of contamination. And perhaps in this case, the FDA would be convinced and wouldn't be issuing a warning letter to that manufacturer. The next topic is on cleaning and disinfection and also the importance of identification in this process. So on this topic, the NX1 says that we should be taking monitoring, we should be monitoring regularly in order to assess the effectiveness of your disinfection program and to detect changes in the type of microbial flora. And for example, you might be detecting organisms resistant to the disinfection scheme that's currently in use. And with that information, you might need to adjust your disinfection program so that you can keep these in front, you can keep all these microorganisms in check. And on this topic, I'd like to quote one article by everybody's good friend, Dr. Tim Sandel, that's published sometime last year. So what he recognized in this paper is that bacteria can develop resistance to disinfection. And he suggests that, well, you can, you could control uh, these organisms by extended use of sporicides, but this also brings its own issue in terms of corrosion to the materials, to services, and risks to health and safety of your operators. So he concludes that the most important response is still control. For example, you control how materials enter the facility, you control how operators behave, and so on and so forth. So enforcing all these controls helps to ensure that microorganisms are less likely to, to be present where they should not be. So essentially to have a good contamination control strategy. His conclusion basically aligns with all the prevention mechanisms that we talked about just now. So preventing microorganisms from getting into the clean room is basically the whole purpose, the foundation of your EM control measures. And microbial identification becomes an important part of assessing this effectiveness of your cleaning and disinfectant procedures. When you know what is present in the environment, what's surviving your disinfectant procedures, you can then design better procedures to control those better. And since we're on the topic of resistance to disinfection and all that, I have a recommendation for a recorded webinar. It is on the Charles River site, uh, website, but it's conducted by Ziva Abraham, who is an independent consultant that works for pharma, biotech, and medical device industries. So in this webinar, she talks about radiation and disinfectant resistance in microorganisms. So if you're interested in this topic, the link is right here on this slide. 
The next element that we are, we are going to discuss about is monitoring. In the new Annex 1, it actually lists out requirements for monitoring quite clearly. So for anything that's detected in grade A and grade B areas, you have to identify those to species level. But importantly, why are we doing this, this identification? One is to identify the source. The other is to assess the risk to your product quality to and to patients. And in order to ensure this evaluation is accurate, is meaningful, your ID needs to be correct and accurate in the first place. It also states that consideration should be given to IDs of organisms in grade C and D areas where action or alert limits are exceeded or following isolation of organisms that may be difficult to control, such as spore formers and molds. And you have to do this at a sufficient frequency to maintain a level of understanding of your typical flora. Why do we have to care about the great C and D areas and why do we have to do it regularly? Because if you have microbes that are going into grades A and B areas, it's likely that they have come through your lower grade areas, your grade Cs and grade Ds. So if you have a good database of your baseline of your microbial flora in these lower grade areas, it will help to prevent them from ingressing into your higher grade areas or in the event that you have an excursion in your grades A and grades B, you can respond more quickly by reviewing historical data and seeing where those organisms might have been isolated in the past. So going back to what we saw in PDA TR88 earlier for investigating microbial deviations. And we have to do this regularly because the typical flora might change over time, as we have seen in this example in the training graph for seasonality of moles previously. So let's now summarize a little bit on the topic of contamination control strategy before, before we move on to talk about microbial ID methodologies. So going back to this slide that summarizes all the different areas of uh, contamination control strategy, you can see that there are numerous areas where an accurate ID can help you in this process. For example, ID of your incoming materials, ID of your product testing results, um, ID of your personnel qualification isolates, uh, your APS uh, simulation results, disinfectant, disinfectant validation, environmental monitoring results, of course, uh, cleaning validation, and trending of your quality events, investigations, and car parts. So all of these shows that ID can play a very important role in multiple areas to cr help create an effective contamination control strategy. So to sum it all up, an accurate ID can help you design an effective contamination control strategy by allowing for effective effective cleaning and disinfection, effective monitoring, and assessing risk to product quality and state of control, and accurate trending for proactive action, effective investigations and CAPA to prevent recurrence. All of these efforts eventually leads to a better operational efficiency because we are taking actions proactively to reduce time consuming and costly deviations. And also in the case that you do have excursions, you can respond more quickly. And of course, all that feeds into your continuous improvement and ultimately ensuring patient safety, which is what we're all here about. So uh, now it's time for another poll question. How important do you think the accuracy of your microbial identification is? That should be easy enough to answer. All right, another minute for everyone to participate in this poll. We have over 50% responses at this point.
interesting responses. So far, there is nobody who selected, not at all. Okay, so good. I guess I'm doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Derry, a minute's up. Oh, back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the response. And I wouldn't say I'm really happy that nobody selected number two. All right, uh, let's move on to the next section about ID methodologies. Uh, when we talk about ID methodologies, really it's about all about accuracy and reproducibility from a technical standpoint. Of course, cost is a good is a big factor as well, but that's not going to be the biggest focus today. So when you look at microbial ID methods that are used in the pharma industry. Traditionally, I would say phenotypic or bio biochemical reactions are um, have been the most popular or most commonly seen in labs, even in the pharma lab, pharma industry. You have seen strips, you have seen cars that goes in the system and gives an ID from a software. So these are the well, the more commonly seen ones. But then over the time, we've also seen that modern technologies gets introduced. Molotov MS, genetic, genetic analyzers, they analyze genetic sequences. And I think more and more people are realizing that what's the oldest, what's the so-called classical, might not be the best methodology around. And then there's, there's the option of doing it uh, with a subcontract lab, outsourcing it to someone else. And we're going to briefly discuss about this as well. So here we have an overview of the different ID methodologies. And on the left here, this column basically shows the central dogma of biology, the genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to protein, which then gets expressed as different phenotypes into catalyst reactions, gram stain reaction, fermentation, fatty acids, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the middle column here, you see different types of microbial ID methodologies that more or less corresponds to the flow of genetic information. The genotypic methods, they analyzes the DNA sequences of serial microbes. The prototypic methods, Molotov MS, they analyze really the entire protein profile of, a, of an isolate, but the ribosomal proteins are the most abundant. So that's the main analyte in Multitop MS technologies. And then on the bottom here, you have the phenotypic methods that looks at biochemical enzymatic reactions of the isolates. So in general, as we flow from top to bottom, as we move further and further away from the DNA sequence, from the genetic, from the original information, accuracy and reproducibility of these ID methods tends to decrease. So on the top, the genotyping methods are basically considered as the gold standard for microbial ID nowadays. And you can see on the bottom um, here from the FDA guidance for CGMP that genotype methods have been shown to be more accurate and precise than traditional biochemical and phenotypic techniques. These methods are especially valuable for investigation to failures for critical samples, et cetera. And then on the bottom, you have phenotypic methods that tend to be affected more by environmental factors, by external factors such as temperature, water content, nutritional content of the of the culture of your environment, or human interpretation. Human interpretation is actually a big factor for phenotypic methods as compared to other more automated and uh, objective methods such as genotypic and prototypic methods as we will see very shortly. So first of all, um, phenotypic methods, personally, I'm not a fan of these. And there are many good reasons for, uh, for saying that. Uh, first and foremost, libraries. Phenotypic methods tend to have very limited libraries because a lot of these systems or methods were originally designed for clinical markets. And in clinical, we only care about a very small subset of all the microorganisms because basically you only care about the pathogens, the ones that are relevant to human 
health. But it's a totally different story when it comes to environmental monitoring. We will talk, talk about what's out there in the air, in the water, on your skin. So if something is not even in the library, it won't be get identified accurately at all. That's I think that's very easy to understand. And then another thing is gram stain. A lot of the phenotypic methods are based on gram stain results. It depends on a gram stain result to choose the correct reagent kit, the correct car, the correct street for that organism. If you get a gram stain wrong, it's very likely that you're going you're going to get a wrong idea in the end. And we all know how labor intensive and subjective gram staining can become. You don't even get a consistent error rate for gram staining. So in one example, we have a customer that tested, um, checked, basically checked their gram stain result, their gram staining performance against genotypic identification results and found that 21% of their gram stain were actually wrong. So if you're using a wrong gram stain result, it's going to lead to a wrong phenotypic identification result. We have case studies on this later on. And then you have external factors like I talked about just now that affects the phenotype of your isolate and affect your phenotypic identification results. If you have the same species, one is from ATCC culture that you resuscitated on, on plate growing happily on the agar. The other it was just freshly isolated from your water system, growing tiny colonies on RTA agar. Do you suppose they're going to have the same kind of phenotypic response on your system and give you the same identification result? result? So that's where unreliability of the, of the phenotypic methods come into play. And then last but not least, uh, I talk about this just now, subjective interpretation allows for the, if the method is still relying on a human personnel, a human operator to tell the difference between a brown color to a green color to a yellow color, that really affects the reliability and consistency of the method. So like I said, we have case studies to look at, and uh, this is actually quite an interesting one in case you haven't seen it before. Uh, again, from our good friend, Dr. Tim Sandel, and Essentially, what happened was that a manufacturer discovered a TNTC bacterial count from a TSB service surface contact plate on a conveyor belt. The isolates were gram stained and then identified on a semi-automated, semi-automated as the keyword, commercial phenotypic system. And the result came back as Yersinia pestis. In case you are wondering, this is the one that causes the plague. And the lab supervisor saw the result and panicked and notified site, site management. We have identified plague at the facility and everybody panicked. So do we have to evacuate the site? Do we have to notify authorities that we have plague on the site? And, or do we have to isolate put everybody into quarantine before we spread plague to the local community? But then upon a deeper look, uh, a more experienced microbiologist raised a few important questions. Do we really have plague on the conveyor belt? First, is it likely that we can identify, that we can isolate your senior pestis on TSB plate, not even a blood agar? Does the colonies even look like gram negatives? I know not very reliable method, but do you have some telltale signs to tell the negatives from the positives on? based on the colonies. And also, upon, after they checked the, the isolate under a microscope, they actually saw endospores, which your senior pestis do not, do not form. So in fact, it turns out that indeed, the isolate wasn't your senior pestis. They didn't say how, but I'm gonna assume that they run the sequencing on that and they identified it as something else. And it turned out that everything started with a wrong gram stain result. So gram positive was stained as a negative. And then that led to a wrong biochemical test kit being used and produced a wrong ID out of the phenotypic system. And then, as you can see, it resulted in a whole lot of mess at the site. And 
just a bit of interesting fact uh, out of this case study. All the critical steps in the event happened during a night shift. So the original EM was on was at night. The plate count, the subculture, the microbial ID, the review of the results by the supervisor, and also raising of the plague alarm. Everything happened on night shifts. And these two paragraphs I quote from the article. Rather than questioning the oddness of the result, an emotive response from the supervisor led to rapid escalation of the situation. And from a human factors perspective, nobody wants to work on night shifts, especially, especially experienced microbiologists. So this leads to less experienced personnel who are often tired and um, making the decision whether or not this identification was really Yersinia pestis. So this made me thinking, remember we're using a semi-automated phenotypic system. Doesn't it defeat the purpose of automation if it is still up to a tired, inexperienced personnel to decide whether or not a result is right? Do we always have to have experienced microbiologists on site on night shift to compensate for the inaccurate ID system? Okay, so if the plague story just now was a little bit too dramatic, we have another example here that's more closer to real life. So this was an example shared with us by a pharma company. So they had an OOS for a bio burden count and their initial ID from the phenotypic system in-house was a gram positive cochurea species. So down to the genus level. And cochurea is often found on human skins and oral cavities. So a human commensal. And we do see cochurea as one of the most commonly identified groups of uh, microorganisms from all our customer samples. So it's not very surprising to see this popping up from environmental monitoring. And this manufacturer actually previously had an OS linked with also with an organism identified as cochurea species from the same sample type. So whatever CARPA that they had back then wasn't really effective. They're having a recurrence of the issue. And it also shared with us the gram stain photo as you can see here, and the magnified version of it on the right, it does kind of look like a gram positive foci, but very roundish uh, cells. But things got worse. So they actually had a repeat deviation again for so this same identification from the in house system. Cochurea species came back. And this time they decided to send a sample for 16S sequencing to. Basically, get down to the bottom to see exactly what was contaminating their samples, what was contaminating their environment. And the genetic analy analyzer's results came back as Acinetobacter nosocomialis. This is a gram negative cocobacillus. So, as you can see on the photo on the left, sort of a grape shaped, jelly bean shaped. So somewhere in between a cocci and a rod. And um, we can see the on this report in the middle here, the phylogenetic tree very clearly identified it as as an atobacter. Now, this species is, is, is an environmental organism and is commonly found in water. Also, it's an important opportunity, opportunistic pathogen that can cause hospital acquired infections as you can tell from the name. So, and it's not a gram positive, it's actually a gram negative. That is often difficult to disdain. And so a lot of time people incorrectly identify it as a gram positive. So again, we have an example here that an incorrect, incorrect gram stain led to an incorrect identification out of the phenotypic system. And this highlights how unreliable this whole procedure can be, which led to incorrect IDs and led to ineffective investigations and ineffective CARPAS. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the multi-self and the sequencing methodologies. 
Molotov, as you might know, uh, also starts with fresh isolated colony, colonies. So we take a colony from the uh, from the plate, and uh, from there you can either directly smear it onto your target plate, or use an ethanol extraction procedure to better isolate the bacteria, uh, the proteins from the isolate. And then what's going to happen on the instrument is that a laser will then shoot onto the uh, onto the sample and then ionize all the protein fragments, which then flies through the flight tube, um, as you can see on that photo. And this generates a mass spec of the protein profile of the entire sample isolate. And then this protein profile is then compared with entries in the library, in the reference library, in order to generate an ID. So if you look at this pathology in general, it has a few characteristics. First of all, it's a modern technology. It's, it's only been used in microbial ID for about two decades, and it works on all sample types, bacteria, is and molds, although it's a little bit more complicated for molds. Um, the sample preparation is quite easy. It's very easy to run it. It's really fast. You can get the result from preparing the result. Uh, you can get the result from preparing the sample to the end result in minutes. And we see that the multi libraries tend to be more diverse than phenotypic libraries, although some of the commercial systems still tend to focus a bit more on clinical markets. And there's no complicated decision trees. You don't have to do gram staining in the beginning. You can just load your sample onto the plate, shoot it with the laser, and you'll get a result at the end. But there's always a downside. It requires complex and therefore costly instrumentation. And also, it still requires a fresh culture. So it's not like genotypic methods where as long as the genome is there, you can identify it. You need a pretty fresh culture to get consistent results. And lastly, let's look at genotypic methods, genetic analyzers. Here again, we're starting from a single pure colony, and then we isolate the target genes from the colony and amplify it by PCR. And then it's subjected to cycle sequencing to get the original sequence data, the raw sequence data. This data is then analyzed, assembled, checked for quality, for example, and then interpreted, compared with entries in the reference library again to generate an ID. So similar to Molitov, sequencing identification it utilizes modern technique. It works on all sample types, bacteria and molds. It's currently the gold standard for microbial ID, but then again, it requires complex and therefore costly instrumentation, reagents, consumables. Uh, you do need someone who's, who's quite skilled to perform this whole procedure. It's quite labor intensive, so not very easy to train and requires a pretty long time to result. It takes hours to prepare the sample. So sample throughput um, is a bit limited. And also very importantly, it requires an updated and validated library in order to perform well. Your ID methods always is only as good as your library. If it's something is not in the library, it's not going to be identified. And with sequencing methods, you actually have a bit of more um, possibilities. You can, you can identify things uh, a little bit better compared to other methods. For example, if we have a group level identification to be sebacea complex, and you really want to identify it down to a species level, not just a complex level, you do have options with genetic analyzers to uh, similar to strain typing to sequence additional uh, regions in the genome and get a better resolution. So for tricky samples, for tricky uh, species groups, genetic analyzers, uh, sequencing methods can help you with a better resolution. So that's the different methodologies where we've looked at. And we have another poll question here for you. So all right, we encourage um, participation. So a minute for everyone.
so here we see um responses on phenotypic, multitop sequencing, and then there's one response on other. So um please don't be shy, you know, feel free to share with us, you know, what are systems that you have been using so that we can learn from, from your experiences. Okay, we're right at the minute. Gary, back to you. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Personally, I like the Molotov, but of course, sequencing is the gold standard. So thank you for your response. Is there anything on the in the chat box? No, 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 no comments on the chat box, Gary. Okay, fine. All right, uh, we're towards the end of the presentation already, just a little bit longer, bear with me. So we've talked about the ID methodologies, the genotypic, prototypic, phenotypic methods, but then there's more that goes into how to obtain an accurate ID result. Like I said, libraries matter a lot. You cannot stress enough the importance of a good library. And it, it actually there's, multiple aspects that goes into a library. But first of all, how diverse your library, how good the coverage is. If the species is not even in the library, you're not going to identify it accurately, accurately at all. And then there's diversity. So especially for Molotov, only having the species name in it is not good enough. You need to have a good strain diversity for that species in order to identify this species consistently under different conditions. And then third, there's the reliability. Are you using open library, open source library that's freely available online, that's not even validated or maintained? Or is your library controlled in a quality environment to ensure compliance? That makes a big difference to the accuracy of your results. There's also one more aspect, which is how the data is analyzed. How is the, how is the match factor for a Molotov method calculated? How is your cutoff criteria to determine a species level identification in Molotov? And also, uh, in genetic analysis and sequencing methods, if, are you only looking at the percentage match to your library entries? Or are you analyzing your results using a final genetic tree approach, which makes more sense and is more reliable than a strict percentage match cutoff for genetic methods? So all of these aspects, technology, library, and data analysis comes into play in order obtaining an accurate ID result. And in talking about accuracy, uh, I wanted to take something from the USB 1113 chapter on microbial characterization, identification, and strain typing. So in this chapter, it describes the impact of having a wrong ID or no ID result. And as you can see on this, on this chart and this graph, it ranks from low impact to high impact, no identification, misidentification to species, and then lastly, misidentification to genus. So no identification is actually the lowest impact. If you don't have an ID, you don't know the result, at least you have the option to use another system or outsource it to send it to someone else to ID. If you have a misidentification to species, it means you get the genus name correct, but then the wrong species. So you're not that far away from the, from the correct answer. And then the third, the highest impact, most dangerous one is to a misidentification to genus. And the system basically completely gets the wrong name. It identifies a staff to a pseudomonas. And think of the plague story just now. A gram positive was identified to a gram negative to Yersinia pestis, which caused total chaos in the facility. And unfortunately, while the highest impact is misidentification to genus, it is also the most difficult to detect. 
when you're identifying an unknown sample and your ID system gives you a result, how are you supposed to know whether this result is right or wrong? So, and that's really the hidden danger with, with a lot of commercial off the shelf ID systems. This slide shows an internal study that we performed from uh, since 2011 to 2022 in comparison to accuracy, the performance of different ID systems. I know this one might be a little bit controversial, like how do you know your results are accurate or not? So our results are based on the validated 16S sequencing ID service, the sequencing library that we have. And we have customers that take part in this kind of comparison studies where they run their own isolates in-house on their own in-house ID systems. And then they send the same samples to us to run on sequencing on multi, and then we compare the results. And here's basically a summary of the outcome. On the top row, you see that isolates with ID are actually pretty high with all of these commercial systems. So you get close to 90% or even close to 100% for sequencing of the samples with an ID. But then if you look at accuracy, the correctness of the results, for example, this phenotypic system can identify 88% of the samples. It gives you a name, but then in 28% of those cases, it's an incorrect name. So that's the, that's the highest impact situation I talked about just now, incorrect to, to genus. So how are we supposed to, to, to mitigate this kind of risks when the system is not accurate at all? And here I have another poll question before, right before the last section. Okay, um, Gary, so... Yeah, so sorry to interrupt. So we're almost coming to the hour. Okay, so yep. yeah, so understand that, um, you know, you have a little bit more content, but uh, we do have some questions uh, from the audience. So instead of yep. going through the poll questions, if you can just, you know, um, do a quick wrap up and then uh, we can, I mean, hopefully you can answer a couple of questions if um, that's okay with you. Yeah, let's just move on to the questions. The, on, the last oh. part is only like two slides. Yeah. Okay, all right. So here um, we have one question. Um, here it goes. So in sequencing method by reference library, are you referring to the gene sequence in NCBI for targeted housekeeping genes to differentiate between different organisms? Now, NCBI libraries is, is what I was referring to as open source, free to use online libraries. So a lot of the entries there are just uploaded by researchers. They're not vetted, they're not validated, they're not checked for accuracy. So using that library is basically similar to searching for information on Wikipedia. So you're basically relying on somebody else's good conscience to update good data onto that database. And then you have the uh, other options like uh, commercial systems, um, genetic analyzers that comes with a database, a reference library provided by the instrument manufacturer. So those uh, tend to be better controlled. It could be validated, um, but then uh, apart from the reliability of the entries, you have to consider about coverage. So how relevant is those species in that library to your type of samples? something that's designed for clinical isolates might not have the best rate of isolation when it comes to environmental isolates, for example. Okay, all right, Gary, thank you for the response. So the second question um, is that in Malditov method, would a mixture of proteins from microbial culture be fragmented and analyzed to give the fingerprint data? Or would yep. specific target protein be purified before Malditov? Uh, no, we'll, we'll be getting the fingerprint data. So uh, go back to this slide. So what you see here on the rightmost picture, that's, that's an example of a spectra that you might get. So we are getting an overall picture of all the proteins that's present and the relative abundance of the different 
um, protein fragments. So we're not isolating any specific protein out of the isolate. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so Gary, we have just one one minute here. Okay, um, sorry, just one one last question, if you can. Um, so how yes. often and how many do you recommend identifying isolates in a plant? So because outsource ID is too expensive for analysis, it's costly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, quite a practical question. As, <laughs> if it's up to me, as many as we can. But then it's uh, but then seriously, you have to uh. Yeah, it has to be based on an overall risk assessment of your process. And a lot of that actually is mentioned in uh, Annex 1. And also, there's the new technical report from PDA that talks about designing a contamination control strategy. And I think it talks about designing of um, monitoring programs, selecting monitoring points, frequencies, and identification as well. So it's Worth looking into that as well. It's a okay. TR, PATR 90, if I'm not correct. Okay, all right. Thank you, Gary. So um, before we end for the day, is any just last message for our audience here before we leave? Oh, yeah. I do want to show my contact details. So in case you have any additional questions, comments, protests, to the presentation today. My email address was right here. Please feel free to reach out. And I believe this recording will be available online later so you can watch back and uh, review as well. Hopefully this has been useful for you and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Gary. So this uh, session will be recorded and uploaded to ISP Singapore Affiliates YouTube channel. Okay, so feel free you know, to revisit um, the session. Uh, at your leisure okay all right so we look forward and um, we thank you for your participation today and we look forward to you joining the next technical tuesday session christina any anything else before we thank end? you very much thank you gary thank you everyone for joining us tonight and have a good uh, remaining evening um and see you soon thank you bye-bye yep. bye-bye